Thank you for joining us for worship today for Shenstone Baptist Church's online service on YouTube. If you'd like to learn more about our church, please check out our website at www.shenstonechurch.com. And if you would like to reach out and contact us, we'd appreciate that as well. And do not hesitate to do so. And if there's a way that we can serve you, especially if you live in the uh, Brantford or Brant County area, please contact us and we would love to serve you in any way that we can. Let's go to prayer together and then we will look at God's word for us today in Genesis chapter 7. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and I just ask for us to know of your presence in a very meaningful way. Uh, these last few days and weeks and months have been hard and challenging. We thank you that we are uh, moving into stage three here in our area of reopening. But Lord, we know that uh, there's still some difficult days ahead. And we know that there's a lot of uncertainty that is out there. And we don't know what the future holds. If anything, uh, this whole experience with this pandemic has uh, shown us how little we control and has uh, impacted uh, just uh, how maybe we view ourselves. And I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to be humble. And Lord, that we would just uh, find our rest and our comfort and our strength in you. And Lord, that we'll find our hope in you. Lord, I pray for those who are facing uh, anxiety or depression and struggling, Lord, through this whole pandemic, that you would just be with them. Lord, let them know of your presence in a very real way. Lord, we thank you that we're able to partner with Onsite Athletics and Sojourn Church and Living Water Church to provide these sports camps for kids in Brantford and in Paris. I just ask, Lord, that you would allow these camps to be successful. We thank you for this first week of camp that went well. We pray the other weeks will go well also. Lord, we pray for the campers who will come, that they will uh, learn about you, Lord. And for those who don't know you, will find salvation through Jesus Christ. For those who do, that they will grow stronger in their faith. We pray for the uh, staff members of each camp, Lord, the long hours and the long days that they are putting in, that on the weekends you will give them the rest, through the week you will give them the energy that they need to honor you uh, by serving you in this way. And Lord, we uh, just pray for those camp weeks that uh, still have very few campers, Lord, that you would just send uh, kids to those camps, again, for your glory, that they may hear about who you are. Lord, we pray for the Back to School Carnival, this opportunity to reach out to our community by supplying some school supplies for them. Just ask that, uh, Lord, we would be able to have an impact at New Beginnings, uh, where we will be going. Lord, and for the other churches who are going into other areas, that they would have an impact for the gospel of Jesus Christ in those areas as well. And Lord, just bless us now as we look into your word. May our faith grow, Lord. May we be convicted where we need to be convicted. May we be encouraged where we need to be encouraged. We pray these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. So if you have your copy of God's word, uh, please turn to Genesis chapter 7. And all we're reading today is verses 1 to 5. Genesis chapter 7, uh, verses 1 to 5. And uh, we will glean some things from that. The title of the sermon today is Noah colon, God's presence and protection. Noah, colon, God's presence and protection. Uh, so I do hope you have your copy of God's word and uh, you're looking at Genesis chapter seven with me. Uh, let us hear the words of the living God together. The Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. This is the word of the Lord. 
did you know that there are two life-size replicas of the Ark in the world today? At least two. I don't know of any others, but I know of at least two. The first one was built in uh, 2014, I believe, by a man named Johan Hybers. It's in the Netherlands. Prior to the pandemic, it averaged about 3,000 visitors a day where people would go and they could walk through this thing and see it and they can hear about the story of Noah but they can hear about the story of salvation of Jesus Christ as well. That is why uh, Mr. Hubers built this ark, was so that he could spread the gospel uh, through this display. The other one is in Kentucky at the Creation Museum. And uh, you can check out both of these arcs uh, on Google. I just see how impressive they really are. And when their travel restrictions are lifted, uh, go and see one. I'm hoping to go and see one uh, one day myself. Uh, the biblical dimensions of the ark would support a seaworthy vessel. Uh, not a ship, mind you. It is a, a massive floating barge. That is essentially what the ark is. And God used this massive floating barge to save humanity and to save the animal kingdom. Uh, today we're going to continue our series on Noah, looking at the biblical record of the flood account and contrasting it particularly with a Hollywood film that came out in 2014 that was starring Russell Crowe. And I also hope to, uh, through this series, any kind of uh, confusion there may be about how the Bible portrays Noah, uh, we can just clear that up for ourselves because uh, Hollywood did not do the best job, let's be honest. Uh, efforts are made to fit this film in the realm of myth to emphasize its epic nature. And one way that they do that is by having these creatures made out of rock called the Watchers. Now these are, uh, according to the story, according to the film, these are fallen angels that God had cast down to the earth and they help Noah to build the ark. Uh, scripture, of course, um, does not create mythology and the story of Noah, while it is epic, is a true story. It's a story about a real man who lived in real time, who lived on this very real earth in a very difficult time, and he was called to live out his faith in God. And he did. He lived faithfully in awful times. And we uh, hear about Noah uh, repeatedly throughout uh, the Old Testament, he comes up in 1 Chronicles 11, 3, 4, Isaiah 54, 9, Ezekiel 14, 14, and then again in verse 20. Uh, he's mentioned in the genealogy of Christ in Luke 3, 36, and uh, he is referenced when Jesus is teaching about the second coming in Matthew 24, 37 to 38. So Noah is a very real person. He is presented as a historic person. And if we remove Noah, if we just place him in the realm of myth or legend, we remove a key member of the line of Christ and salvation history is greatly impacted. In today's passage, um, there's a couple of important things that we will learn about God's character and the importance of keeping Noah as a real person who lived in real time. And there's lots to unpack here. Uh, so I hope that this series of messages on Noah and how God interacts with humanity uh, just uh, points you back to scripture and that you will do your own study, your own in-depth uh, reading of God's word and studying to uh, get all you can out of these few chapters in the book of Genesis. I think you'll find that uh, a very um, worthy uh, of your time. So uh, please go ahead and do that. And of course, uh, as always, if you have any questions about uh, the sermon that uh, we are looking at, the text or anything, please do not hesitate to reach out to me again, either by call or by email. And I would love to interact with you on God's word. So our first point is this. Our first point is this. God communicates clearly. God communicates clearly. The movie recognizes that Noah has a close relationship with God, and God is always referred to as the creator in this film. And one of the best lines in the movies is spoken by Methuselah, uh, probably the most accurate depiction of any of the biblical characters in this rendition of the Noah story. And Methuselah is uh, well played by Sir Anthony Hopkins, who is an excellent actor. And Noah goes to Methuselah to just ask questions about the, the visions and dreams he's getting from God. 
And Methuselah says this, he speaks to you. You must trust he speaks in a way you can understand. And this is a very important statement uh, about God. If God is going to communicate to humanity, he must communicate in a way that we understand what he is trying to say. It can't be ethereal. It can't be beyond our comprehension. It has to be something that we are able to grasp. It has to be something that we are able to grasp. Now, uh, we read in Hebrews chapter 1 that God has tried to communicate to humanity uh, in many ways throughout uh, all of time. He's done so through his prophets. Uh, and he does through the pinnacle of God's revelation. The pinnacle of God's communication is Jesus Christ. In fact, the entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. So God is communicating clearly uh, about who he is, who we are, what his plan for humanity is, and he does so through his word. He gives us a very clear statement or statements of what he intends and what he uh, desires for humanity in the Bible. Throughout the movie, however, God speaks in visions and dreams, and they're kind of ambiguous. They are kind of ambiguous. He never speaks to Noah directly. He is presented, God is presented as distant and aloof. The visions and dreams that are given to Noah turn out to be ambiguous. In fact, Noah, in the end, completely misunderstands God's vision uh, and dreams. In fact, he thinks that God's desire is to wipe out all of humanity. Why he put them through the exercise of building this ark if he just wanted to wipe everyone out, I don't think we ever get an answer to that. But even when the ark comes to rest uh, at the end of the film, Noah thinks that he needs to kill his family, his wife, his sons, his daughters-in-law, and their children as well. The biblical record is that God does not communicate ambiguously. In fact, God, create, God communicates very, very clearly. There is no ambig ambiguity in Genesis chapter 6 and 7. God is judging the sin of humanity. God is judging the wickedness of humanity. Uh, God tells us that uh, every inclination of the heart is wickedness all the time. Um, and humanity has progressively moved further and further away from God. We see that in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, when they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, they were cast out of the Garden of Eden, so they are moving further away from God. In Genesis chapter 4, when Gain kills Abel, after God warns him not to do it, uh, he begins to move eastward, and moving east is always a direction away from God. Uh, so the world is filled with corruption. The world is filled with violence and God is grieved. And so God announces his judgment. God announces his judgment. And he says that he, he is he is done contending with humanity, that the number of his years will be 120. Now, some think that is the longest that humanity can live. But I also think there's a good interpretation where that's how long it will take Noah to build the ark. That's how long it will take Noah to build the ark had to gather all the resources and all the supplies. Uh, life length was uh, was greater back then just because of the way that uh, the world was. And so Noah would have 120 years to build this ark. Uh, and we also find out that during this time in 2 Peter 2 5, we read that Noah is a preacher of righteousness that Noah is a preacher of righteousness. So for this 120 years, God, uh, Noah is not keeping uh, his faith quiet. He is not keeping God's message quiet. As he is building the ark, he is preaching righteousness. He is calling people to change their ways, to turn to God, and to live righteously. But no one responded. Though God is offering salvation, no one responded to Noah's preaching. Now, salvation is a word that we use a lot, and perhaps it's a word that um, not everyone understands the way that we do. Uh, perhaps we as Christians need to be very clear when we're talking about salvation, what that really means. Uh, 
And we need to communicate clearly. As God has communicated clearly, we need to communicate clearly as well. So if there is the salvation that God is offering, it clearly indicates we need to be saved from something, that we are in danger. And what God is saying is that we are in danger from our own sin, that we are in danger from our own fallenness, that uh, we are uh, not perfect, that we, in fact, are uh, very imperfect. And I don't think any of us would admit that we are perfect. We all know that we have flaws. We all know that we have shortcomings. We all know that uh, we don't always treat people the way that we should. We know that we don't always speak the way that we should. We know that we don't always have the, bad, the best attitude. And those things, God says, are sin. Those are things that we do wrong. And they show our fallenness. They show our corruption. And they show our sinfulness. So we need to be rescued from our sin. We need to be rescued from ourselves. We can't save ourselves. Scripture is very clear on that. We are unable to save ourselves. We need to receive salvation from an outside source. In Genesis 6, we, are, uh, we have a picture of a world that is corrupt, a world that is selfish, a world that is unwilling to listen to God. But that doesn't stop God from communicating clearly and God offers for us to be saved from that corruption to be rescued to have a new beginning in fact when we get in the new testament uh, we are told about this new beginning about becoming a new creation about being given a new life and that is what God is communicating to us he is saying look you have this sin problem and it needs to be dealt with and the only way that can be dealt with is if you receive the salvation that I am offering and the greatest salvation that God offers is through Jesus Christ. Because of our sin, we cannot come into the presence of God. But because Jesus died on the cross, taking the punishment for our sin, so that we could be forgiven by substituting himself in our place, our sins can be forgiven, that God's judgment falls on Jesus instead of us. And by putting our faith in him, our sin is forgiven. And we are cleansed from that unrighteousness, from that sin, from that corruption. We are made new. So God communicates that clearly. That is the purpose of the Bible, for God to communicate to humanity who he is, who we are, and what we need from him. And how we can have that new life, that eternal life that he offers us. This is what God does for us. So God communicates clearly. Secondly, God provides the plan of salvation. God provides the plan of salvation. So all over the world, we find ancient cultures have a flood story. Outside of Noah, the Epic of Gilgamesh is probably the most well-known. But in those stories, the gods are seen as afraid, or they're seen as petty. They send the flood for population control. They send the flood because they don't like the noise that humanity makes. Uh, the flood is something that gets out of control, that they didn't intend for the whole world to be flooded, but these gods uh, accidentally flood the entire world. Um, the biblical narrative does not show that at all. God is not petty. God is not upset about the noise of humanity. God does not accidentally flood the world. The biblical narrative shows that God, or Elohim, or Yahweh, two names for the same God of the Bible, is in control and has authority to judge sin and does so righteously. And the control that God has is over chaos. Now, water in the ancient world, uh, the sea in particular, is often a symbol of chaos, and that's true in the Bible as well. So if you remember, back in Genesis uh, chapter 1 and verse 2, the water's were over the earth, over the entire globe. And here again, God is going to send a flood that covers the entire globe. God is going to control chaos for his purposes. So God communicates to Noah that a flood will come and will wipe out the earth. So God is starting over again. That reference back to Genesis 1-2, where the water uh, covered the entire earth. God is saying, I'm starting again. I am grieved by what I see humanity has done, and I am starting again. 
And this also indicates to us that it is a universal flood. There's a lot of discussion within uh, biblical circles, scholarly circles, whether the flood was local or the flood was global. I think as we read the texts, the best answer is that it is global. If we're going back and God is re kind of restarting, press the restart button, then we see that as the waters cover the globe in Genesis 1-2, now the waters are going to cover the globe. Again, as we go through this uh, series of sermons, we'll see other evidence that it is a universal or a global flood, not just a local flood. So Noah is kind of seen as another Adam, and God will begin again with Noah and his family. And notice here the protection of the family unit, husband and wife and their children and their wives. Humanity is preserved in its basic family structure. Humanity is preserved in its basic family structure. So God gives the dimensions of the ark to Noah. We read about that last week, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 40 feet high. He tells him about the type of wood it is to be made of, cypress wood. It makes rooms or uh, nests. Uh, he is tall, called to complete the roof, uh, and the ark is to fin be finished within 18 inches. So light can get in air, uh, light can get in, fresh air can get in, and it's to be sealed with pitch. So it is waterproof, and there is one door. There is one door, and we learned that in Genesis 8, 6, there is a window. Now God tells Noah what to build and how to build it so that he will escape the flood. Just as God told Moses how to build a tabernacle so they could worship God properly, God is now telling Noah how to build the ark so he can be saved. The character of God is to alert his creation to the need of salvation and that salvation can be found. The character of God is to alert his creation to the need of salvation and that salvation can be found. We see that in the use of the word ark. Uh, and this word ark comes up uh, in a few places within the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that were written by Moses. Uh, Pentateuch meaning five books, the five books of Moses. The word ark literally means box, but it has come to exemplify the presence and the protection of God. So God comes to Noah and says, you need to build a giant box so that you can be saved. So when Noah goes into the ark, he is protected from the flood. In the story of Moses, another true story, in the story of Moses in Exodus chapter 2 and verses 3 and 5, uh, Noah, or Moses is said to be put into a basket. Now that word basket in the Hebrew is the same word here used for ark. So Moses is also being placed into an ark, and this ark carries Moses and the Nile, and he is protected by this ark, and he comes into the presence of Pharaoh's daughter. Later, the Ark of the Covenant is built, and God was with his people. When the ark moved, the people moved. When the ark stayed, the people stayed. They weren't to go anywhere with God. So the ark becomes a symbol of the presence and the protection of God. It was for Noah. It was for Moses, and it was for the people of Israel as they traveled uh, with the Ark of the Covenant. So God communicates clearly, and God provides the plan of salvation. And in that plan of salvation, we have God's protection, and we have God's presence. So how do we conclude? Well, God tells Noah clearly what he must do to be saved. The plan of salvation is clear. Will Noah trust God and build this ark? Well, we know in chapter 6 that he did. We know at the end of chapter 6 that the Lord, that God does, or sorry, Noah does all the Lord commands him. And we see that repeated again here in verse 5. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah is listening to God. Noah is trusting God. In a world that would think he was crazy because he's building this giant floating box. He listened to God. He put God's word above all others. The plan of salvation is clear and it's available to Noah and Noah responds. What about us? Do we know of the plan of salvation 
from God through Jesus Christ. And are we listening to what God has to say to us through Jesus Christ? Do you trust God's plan of salvation? We are still a corrupt people. We still have sin that needs to be dealt with. And God offers us his plan of salvation through Jesus Christ, through his death and his resurrection, that we may have a new life, that we may have a new beginning. Now, there are many in the world who think we're crazy for believing in Jesus Christ. Now, there are many in the world who would rather not hear about Jesus. They would rather us be silent. But God has communicated clearly. This is his message of salvation for humanity. In Noah's day, no one outside of Noah's family responded. In our day, we need to continue to communicate it clearly so people still have the opportunity to respond. Just as God gave the people 120 years before the flood came, he's giving us time now. He's giving us time now to hear his voice and to respond to his plan of salvation. If you haven't already, I hope that you have. I hope that you will. And if you have responded, I hope you know what you have in Jesus Christ and you are living faithfully for him as Noah did. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this time that we are able to come and just spend it with you. We thank you for the example uh, of Noah. We thank you that he listened to you. But we thank you, more importantly, that you communicate clearly. We thank you that you provide the plan of salvation. And, and all we have to do is respond to that plan, that you have done all the work. We simply must listen and obey. I pray that we will be like that. I pray that we will be a people who will respond, that we, as Noah did, will do everything that you have commanded us. Bless our week, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining me, and I look forward to uh, meeting with you again, and I pray that you will have a great week. God bless you. Thank you for watching.